Adorno and Iran, Critical Theory and Islamic Antisemitism by Stefan Grigot. It's a little abstract here. Quote, after Auschwitz, end quote, said the German philosopher and social critic Theodor Adorno, we should embrace a new categorical imperative, quote, Arrange your thoughts and actions so that Auschwitz will never will not repeat itself, so that nothing similar will happen. End quote. But what is the meaning of that imperative today? In a lengthy essay, Stefan Grigat makes the case that quote, if we want to be serious about Adorno's categorical imperative, then we should do everything to prevent the Iranian regime from realizing its murderous ideology. End quote. The essay was written in summer 2020. Part 1. Understanding Antisemitism It is often said that antisemitism is a result of a lack of knowledge about Jews, Judaism, and the Jewish state. I think that this idea is not only wrong, but also underestimates the problem. Were it correct, the situation would not be nearly so bad and could be easily addressed, for example, through meetings between Jewish and non-Jewish young people, synagogue open days, and study trips to Israel. Of course, all these things should be done. However, they will not banish anti-Semitism because it is a comprehensive worldview of a delusional, projective kind. Instead of downplaying anti-Semitism as mere prejudice, we have to decipher it through a critique of the, quote, anti-Semitic society, end quote, as Theodore W. Adorno and Max Horkheimer put it in Dialectic of Enlightenment. Anti-Semitism is best understood not as an anthropological constant, but as an ever-changing, always delusional reaction of some non-Jews to their experience of an always evolving society. From this point of view, the anti-Semitism of the 20th and 21st century can be seen as the epitome of anti-emancipatory ideology in which hatred of enlightenment, self-awareness, and freedom are combined. Because capitalist society is uncompreh uncomprehended, fetishistic, and self-mystifying, it contains a tremendous urge towards the delusional concretization of abstraction, i.e. to put a tangible name and face on the source of distress. To simplify, this need to scapegoat, which seems to me to be one of the decisive elements of anti-Semitism, is then inherent to modern capitalist society. The task of any materialist critique of anti-Semitism is to make visible the connection between the anti-Semites and the society that produces them. In a delusional projection onto the, quote, Jewish principle, end quote, and its supposed physical embodiments, Anti-Semites are fighting against social and individual ambivalences, and against individual and social contradictions and crises. This seems to me to be the constant factor in the different manifestations of anti-Semitism. At the same time, however, we must make it clear that this connection exculpates neither the anti-Semite nor the society. Even in such an unfree society, individuals who decide to engage in hatred and violence against Jews are responsible for their decisions and must be held to account for them. Anti-Semitism is a regressive revolt against the global principle of a subjectless rule and the experience of alienation or loss of control in the face of an abstract economy and a political system perceived as a burden and a threat. Understood in this way, anti-Semitism is a basic ideology of a capitalist society that produces its own negation, both positively and negatively. The critique of the fetishism and mystification of capitalist society developed in Karl Marx's critique of political economy is of decisive importance for the critique of this ideological worldview. The conceptual sharpness of the developed critique of political economy is necessary in order to prevent or at least decisively impede the mutation of economic criticism into persecutory resentment. A critique of anti-Semitism must show that it is not simply a form of racism directed against Jews. This does not mean that anti-Semitism must be fought more than racism, but it does mean keeping in mind the different modes of operation of racism and anti-Semitism in order to be able to combat both more effectively. Racism expresses a demarcation from, quote, those of lesser worth, end quote. 
Victims of racism are reproached not for their superiority, but for their inferiority. Racism is directed at the powerlessness of the racially classified. Anti-Semites have always been aware of the vulnerability of the Jews, which enable a one-sided onslaught on them, at least prior to the establishment of Israel. However, they imagine their prospective victims, in sharp contrast to the victims of racism, not as powerless, but as all-powerful. In the eyes of the anti-Semites, Jews, as the embodiment of abstraction, as the tangible face they give to their society, the cause of their otherwise causeless troubles, rule the whole world. This is something which, in the minds of racists, would be beyond the capacities of the victims of racism. To put it another way, nobody fantasy, fantasizes about a, quote, African world conspiracy, end quote. Anti-Semites fantasize about their destruction by a superior intellect, by the, quote, masters of money, end quote, or more recently by a Jewish statehood that is deemed illegitimate. They see themselves as forestalling this imagined threat through the destruction of this abstraction in the form of the Jews, whether individually or as a sovereign political entity. It is of the essence of anti-Semitism that Jews are placed in a no-win situation. Rich Jews are faulted for their success and the poor are derided as scroungers. The assimilated Jew is deemed a treacherous subverter of the people, the traditionalist as an incorrigible misfit. The sexually active Jew is considered to be a corrupter of youth, the abstinent and impotent weakling. Anything Jews do will be used by anti-Semites as a new material for their delusions. Should a behavior not fit into the projective imagery of an anti-Semite, the unexpected action will be construed as a particularly devious means of hiding the Jews' true intentions. The critique of anti-Semitism, then, must be concerned not with the objects, but the subjects of anti-Semitism, so not with the Jews, Judaism, or the Jewish state, but with the psychic needs and the sometimes conscious and sometimes unconscious motives of the Jew hater. Part 2 Three modes of combating anti-Semitism, education, social change, coercion. In the face of the anti-Semitic agitation that is required to produce and sustain the persecutory mentality, we are not powerless. The aim must be to counteract the anti-Semitic delusions that anti-Semites allow themselves to be terrified by, promoting self-understanding and encouraging self-criticism. Education. First, we may use education so that individuals learn to deal with these individual and social ambivalences, contradictions and crises in a mature and responsible way. However, one must keep in mind the, quote, limits of enlightenment, end quote, a phrase that not by chance was used by Adorno and Horkheimer as a subtitle for their famous essay, Elements of Antisemitism. Every action, whether political, police, judicial, or even military that is directed towards the prevention of anti-Semitic practice and propaganda is proof that genuinely effective resistance to anti-Semitism is possible. However, these urgently necessary defense me defensive mechanisms cannot put a definitive, quote, end to anti-Semitism, end quote. Social change. So, Second, we should also seek to establish new social relations that promote an essential minimum of individual and social reflection and the formation of an effective maturity. Anti-Semitism can, in the last analysis, only be made to disappear through the abolition of its social foundations. Quote, an end to anti-Semitism, end quote, would therefore ultimately mean the establishment of a society free from domination and exploitation in which everyone could be different without fear or pressure. However, even in this society, the, quote, arm of criticism and the criticism of arms, end quote, to paraphrase the young Marx, are also effective against anti-Semitic agitation and practice. Coercion. Third, 
as the impact of education is necessarily limited and the establishment of new social relations is a distant horizon, the anti-Semites must be prevented from pursuing their goals, the combination of which is mass murder by coercion. Adorno is right to say that in the face of blatant anti-Semitism, the, quote, available means of coercion, end quote, should be used, quote, without sentimentality, end quote. This is true both within the framework of the nation-state and in the confrontation with anti-Semitic actors on the international stage. We need to observe not only Marx's categorical imperative, but also Adorno's. Yes, we need Marx's, overturn all relations in which man is a humiliated, enslaved, forsaken, and contemptible being, end quote, in order to maintain at least the theoretical possibility of envisaging a final end to anti-Semitism. But Adorno's post-Auschwitz categorical imperative is for now the need for, quote, unfree mankind to arrange their thoughts and actions so that Auschwitz will not repeat itself, so that nothing similar will happen, end quote. Part 3. Islamic anti-Semitism is a clear and present danger. The analysis of the geopolitical reproduction of anti-Semitism in the form of anti-Zionism is now a central task for a critical theory of anti-Semitism. When it demonstrations in Europe, Hamas and Hezbollah flags are quite openly displayed, and in Germany phrases such as, quote, Jew, Jew, cowardly pig, come out and fight alone, end quote, are shouted by hundreds without any intervention from the police. And when a leader at a NATO member country, Turkey, states that the defense measures taken by Israel against Hamas and Islamic Jihad surpass the barbarism of Nazis without having any consequences, we get an idea of the isolation of the Jewish state. In discussions about Israel-Palestinian conflicts, one constantly comes up against the assertion that anti-Semitism in the Arab and Islamic countries is a result of the Middle East conflict. Against this, educational efforts at all levels must explain the extent to which Arab and Islamic anti-Semitism are a central cause of this conflict, whose course they have decisively influenced both in the past and present. In the academic sphere, we need institutes, excuse me, in the academic sphere, we need institutes devoted to the criticism of anti-Semitism that do not restrict themselves to historical research into European Jew hatred, but make a priority of the study of contemporary Israel-fixated anti-Semitism. 3.1. Roots. The Muslim Brotherhood. Yusuf al Karadawi, who, as a preacher on Al Jazeera, and head of the European Council for Fatwa and Research, is one of Sunni Islam's most influential intellectuals, has gone beyond denying the Holocaust and now presents it as an example to be followed. According to him, Hitler was the, quote, ultimate punishment, end quote, for the Jews, inflicted on them by Allah for their depravity. In the future, he believes the Muslims will take on the task. In 2009, he stated that, quote, God willing, the next time this punishment will be inflicted by the hand of the faithful, end quote. The Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, in which al Qaradawi has his roots, shaped all the later currents of radical Islam, including the Iranian regime and Hezbollah. While these latter are, of course, in some respects in competition with brotherhood groups and parties, they can also cooperate with them, especially when it comes to fighting Israel and with respect to a shared hostility to the rulers of Saudi Arabia. Considered by some supporters of the Iranian regime to be descendants of Jews, the prototypical Islamist organization, the Muslim Brotherhood, was founded in 1928 in the same period as the rise of the fascist mass organizations in Europe. It also drew inspiration from the writings of Iranian Islamists of the 19th century, 
the Nazis actively supported the establishment of the Brotherhood materially and ideologically. After 1945, the Muslim Brotherhood became the, quote, biggest anti-Semitic organization in the world, end quote, with around a million members. The rapid rise in its membership at the beginning of the 1930s resulted, like the support for European fascism and Nazism, but in a different religious context, from a massive and delusional projective reaction to the crisis-ridden onslaught of capitalist modernity. The reaction against the ambivalences and emancipatory potential of modernity was also one of the main grounds for the mass support of Khomeini from the 1960s onwards in Iran. With the political program of the Muslim Brotherhood, excuse me, while the political program of the Muslim Brotherhood was legitimated by reference to the religious texts of Islam, resulting in clear differences from fascism and Nazism in spheres such as sexual morality and gender politics, it closely resembled and still closely resembles that of the radical right in Europe in crucial politico-economic respects. Rejection of parliamentar parliamentarianism and multi-party democracy, struggle against liberalism and Marxism, demonization of interest, and proclamation of a community of interest between capital and labor, which had to be has to be defended against the allegedly destructive forces of an abstraction identified as Jewish. In their advocacy of sacrifice, their death cult, and their anti-Semitism, texts such as Industry of Death, issued by the Brotherhood's founder, Hassan al-Banna, in 1938, and Sayyid Kitub's 1950 tract, Our Struggle with the Jews, recall Nazism despite their Islamic orientation, and these pamphlets are still disseminated in millions of copies in some Islamic countries. Before the Islamic Revolution in Iran, Sayyid Qutub's writings were translated into Farsi by Iran's current supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, and continue to form one of the central ideological reference points of the Iranian Islamists. Just like the Nazis, even if less successfully, the Sunni jihadists and Iranian Islamists are concerned not only with the enlistment of a people for the purposes of exploitation and domination, but with the formation of a society of martyrs in which all the individual sacrifices, in which the individual sacrifices himself for the Ummah, the community of all Muslims. Despite all the real and significant differences in historic context, legitimating references, economic and political structures, and military capability, the hate of objects, excuse me, Jesus Christ, despite all the real and significant differences in historic context, legitimating references, economic and political structures, and military capability, the hate objects of the Islamic jihadists resemble those of Nazism, communism, and materialism, liberalism, and Western, quote, plutocracy, end quote, individualism, emancipation, and Zionism. After 1946, Hassan al-Banna showered praise on Amin el-Husseini, the rabidly anti-Semitic mufti of Jerusalem, who had collaborated with the Nazis and resided in Berlin after 1941. He managed to evade prosecution by the Allies after the Second World War by fleeing to Cairo, where in 1946, Albana, today still a revered figure, declared him, quote, What a hero, what a miracle of a man, who defied an empire with the help of Hitler and Germany and fought against Zionism. Germany and Hitler are no more, but Amin al-Husseini will pursue the struggle, end quote. Quote, Islamic fascism, end quote. Recently, the German-Egyptian writer Hamed Abdel Samad has brought the term, quote, Islamic fascism, end quote, back into the discussion, emphasizing the links between Islamism in general and the Muslim Brotherhood in particular with fascism and Nazism. 
Unfortunately, he does so resting on a dubious exegesis of Islamic theology rather than on an ideological critical understanding of anti-Semitism, anti -Semitism, in which modern Islamic Jew hatred is decoded as a projective repudiation of a new, ambivalent, and potentially emancipatory form of society as a form of modern anti-modernism. The specific quality of the Islamic anti-Semitism characteristic of the Brotherhood and Iranian regime is missed. As Kuntzel put it, quote, Only here do we find the degrading anti-Judaism of early Islam fused with the modern conspiracy theorizing anti-Semitism, end quote. Today, use of the term, quote, Islamic fascism, end quote, excites knee-jerk reactions, particularly in parts of the left. However, it is virtually unavoidable when it comes to dealing with authoritarian anti-Semitic mass movements with a leader cult and a martyrdom ideology that wage permanent campaigns against groups deemed threatening to the unity of the Ummah, use unrestrained brute force against political opponents, and advocate a, quote, third way, end quote, between capitalism and socialism, East and West. A more serious question is whether the fixation on the term, quote, fascism, end quote, does not tend to underplay the anti-Semitic dimension, since the centrality of anti-Semitism in all variants of the Islamist discourse make it far closer to Nazism, despite all the differences in other spheres, than to classical fascism of the Italian variety. This centrality is especially clear in the case of the Islamist ideology of the regime that has ruled Iran since 1979, and its allies such as Hezbollah, which today present one of the main threats to Israel. 3.2. Fruits. The Iranian Regime. The Iranian regime's anti-Semitism has taken three forms. Traditional Jew hatred that is especially apparent in, but not confined to its founder, Khomeini, who is still revered by the regime's supporters. The denial and relativization of the Holocaust. The explicit commitment to destroy Israel and the regional policies that results from this com that commitment. I will discuss these three forms in more detail below. But first, it is necessary to establish in some detail the unique character of the Iranian regime and its, quote, Islamic revolution, end quote. For that character is often misunderstood by Western politicians and policy makers. The character of the Iranian regime. What distinguishes the Iranian regime from other despotisms conditioned by Islam and makes it especially dangerous is the combination of a revolutionary activist Islamism centered on belief in the Mahdi, the state-driven effort to obtain the technology for weapons of mass destruction, and a radical anti-Zionism shared by all currents within the regime. The Mahdi is the, 20, is the hidden 12th Shiite Imam who is... Mm, Jesus Christ. Let me back up a second. The Mahdi is the hidden 12th Shiite Imam who, it is believed, will one day return. Under the Iranian constitution, it is the Mahdi rather than the supreme leader who is the head of state in Iran. Vilayat e Faki, the quote, guardianship of the Islamic jurists, end quote, is intended through puritanical terror within and the export of the Islamic revolution abroad to pave the way for, this ret for his return. The Mahdi's return. The regime that has ruled Iran since 1979 openly proclaims its religious ideological goal of world rule. Proving the existence of this claim does not require sophisticated critical techniques. A brief look at the explicit content of the writings of the regime's founder, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, is quite enough. Moreover, Ali Khamenei,
has described Israel as a, quote, cancerous tumor that should be cut and will be cut, end quote, has also made clear statements in this respect. The anti-Semitic and conspiracy theorizing worldview and the threats of destruction against Israel shared by all factions of the regime play a decisive and indeed necessary role in integrating the hostile gangs of the Iranian regime, and the factional fight is not only over who is to get the biggest share of the pie, but also over who can best advance the program of eliminatory anti-Zionism. In the original and for a long time operational conception of the Islamic Republic, the supreme leader ruled over the factions and mediated between them. The quote, Prince of the Believers, end quote, as one of the many titles held by the leader describes him, embodies the awareness that, as Khomeini once put it, the regime needs two wings in order to achieve its goals and would be in danger of falling if one of them were simply to be cut off. This conception was called into question by Khamenei's clear and early support for the Ahmadinejad, excuse me, for Ahmadinejad during the 2009 electoral farce. Since Rouhani's election in, in 2013, it has been once again, it has once again become operational. One expression of this restoration has been the composition of Rouhani's first government. In choosing his ministers, Rouhani took into account the wishes of almost all the factions to create a kind of grand coalition in order to broaden the base of the regime and so strengthen it for the prospective annihilation effort. Admittedly, supporters of Ahmadinejad and his long-standing spiritual mentor and political promoter, Ayatollah Mezba Yazdi, who has declared that, quote, the Jews are the most corrupt in the world, the most seditious group among all human beings, and they will not leave Muslims alone until they destroy Islam, end quote, were not represented in Rouhani's first cabinet. However, the fact that Khamenei has appointed Ahmadinejad, a member of the Influential Expediency Council, shows that even this faction, which stands for an especially radical interpretation of the Mahdi doctrine, continues to play a role. That still holds true after Ahmadinejad was disqualified from the presidential race in 2017 by the Guardian Council. In October 2019, during the second term of President Rouhani, Iranian cleric Ibad Mohammad Tabar declared, quote, God willing, when the hidden imam arrive, arrives, all us Muslims will, under his leadership, confront the biggest enemy of Islam, the Jews. According to the Quranic verse, the Jews are the greatest enemy of Islam. End quote. The struggle for official positions and influence between the spiritual, political, and military leaderships, the revolutionary guards, secret services, and economic elites, and the Larijani brothers, the Khamenei circle, and the Rath Sanjani clan has calmed down a bit under Rouhani. Since 2013, the various factions must pay somewhat more heed to the overall interest of the regime. However, the interest groups have not disappeared, and further, such conflicts are inevitable, particularly in relation to efforts to contain the power of the Revolutionary Guards. Khamenei himself has clearly determined, was clearly determined to rein in the Pasdaran's power somewhat, following speculation during Ahmadinejad's term of office about whether the guards, who had been extending their control over ever-widening spheres of economic and political life, really needed the clergy any more, and whether the theocracy might turn into an open military dictatorship. As a result, there were only three Pasdaran ministers in Rouhani's first government, whereas over half of the members of Ahmadinejad's first cabinet were recruited from either the Revolutionary Guards or Basiji. However, this shift has nothing to do with some kind of wind of moderation. 
it represents merely a shift between power centers, in this case towards the traditional security apparatus, which is in competition with the posturon, and in particular in favor of the VEVAK security service, which, had, which was more strongly represented in Rouhani's first government than in any since 1979. The Iranian regime's aggressive foreign policy, which is characterized simultaneously by pragmatism and a mania for annihilation, corresponds domestically with a social form of organizing that is characterized by the rule of competing gangs or, quote, rackets. Drawing on Max Horkheimer's theory of a racket and Franz Neumann's study Behemoth, Gerhard Scheidt analyzed the Islamic Republic as a, quote, non-state, end quote. According to his analysis, the Islamist Revolution of 1979 represents, quote, the opposite of the bourgeois revolution which triumphed in France. Both revolutions lifted the state's monopoly on the use of force and replaced it with the power of terrorist groups. However, in one case, the terror results in the rule of law that is guaranteed for the sake of capital's realization by a new monopoly on violence. And in the other case, terror continues undiminished in the different forms of Sharia and sees itself shielded by the name of Allah and oil revenues. End quote. Gerhard Scheidt. I think he wrote the uh, entry on rackets in the Sage uh, Handbook of... Uh, Frankfurt School Critical Theory. Since Khamenei's accession, the Iranian regime has been characterized by a rivalry of rackets hostile to each other while the supreme religious leader reigns above all. In this way, the whole Iranian constitution cannot be understood as a form of bourgeois law. Quote, the complex structure of the constitution is merely there to provide room for the disparate activities of these rackets who declared declaredly prefer the state of emergency, end quote. Since 1979, parallel to the state's organs, additional institutions have been formed in Iran. The influence of the regular courts of justice is restricted through the existence of numerous special courts. Beyond those military tribunals that are common in other countries, there exists so-called, quote, revolutionary courts, end quote. The, quote, court for the justice of bureaucracy, end quote the, quote, special court for the clergy, end quote, and, quote, press courts, end quote. Besides the national army, the Pasteuron has been established as an alternative revolutionary military force, which today is one of the most influential and probably the most dangerous racket, which is today one of the most influential and probably the most dangerous racket within the regime's power structure. The revolutionary guards not only represent the regime's military elite unit, but also one of the most important economic conglomerates in Iran, which provides its members with economic and social gains. For several years now, the Pasteuron have used their military power to gain control of crucial branches of Iran's economy, particularly in the realm of foreign trade. Similar to German National Socialism, but in a different way, the Islamic, quote, non-state, end quote, of Iran is capitalist and anti-capitalist at the same time. Quote, its position on ownership of the means of production is different in the respect that in the form of an industrialized mode of production, this kind of ownership only exists to a minimal extent. Universal law and contract have disappeared here as well, replaced by the racket's arbitrary use of actions, end quote. A central difference to national socialism, however, is its position on labor. The affiliation with the Islamist collective different from Nazi Germany, has almost nothing to do with labor as a commodity. Quote, in such a collective, even somebody who does not have any prospect for a job can feel useful and not superfluous, even when he does not expect the UMA to provide him with one. Everything beyond the racket system that threatens and exposes the individual to superfluousness, the individual projects on a total enemy, the Gegenfolk, the counter-nation, end quote. These projections culminate in a suicidal desire for annihilation that concentrates on the state of Israel that includes self-sacrifice and that is virtually invoked by the Iranian Islamist ideology of martyrdom. 
the Iranian regime's three forms of anti-Semitism. 1. The Iranian regime's Jew hatred. Explicit Jew hatred is especially marked in Khomeini's... Oh, excuse me. The explicit Jew hatred... Jesus Christ. The Iranian regime's Jew hatred. Explicit Jew hatred is especially marked in Khomeini's pre-revolutionary writings, but even after 1979, it continually breaks through and today determines, alongside traditional Islamic laws, discriminatory practices against Iran's Jewish minority. In the latter part of the 1930s, the future revolutionary leader Khomeini, no, excuse me, Khomeini was <laughs> a regular listener to the National Socialist shortwave radio station, Radio... Sezen, which disseminated anti-Semitic Nazi propaganda in the Middle East. This does not mean that Khomeini, or Khomeini, Jesus Christ, Khomeini, identified totally with Hitler's ideology, about which he is said sometimes to have made disparaging remarks. Other religious notables, such as Ayatollah Abu al-Qasem Kashani, among whose pupils Khomeini must be reckoned, and who in the 1940s was interned in Iran because of his, quote, pro-fascist, end quote, attitude, however, took an explicitly positive stance towards Nazism. In relation to anti-Semitism, the current Iranian regime is a classic example of the continued impact of Nazism after its military defeat. Khomeini's ideology was not directly directed solely against the Israeli state but particularly pre-1979. Khomeini's ideology was not directed solely against the Israeli state, but particularly pre-1979, was open about its antagonism to the Jews. In this respect, the future revolutionary leader could draw on the tradition of 19th century Persian Islamic anti-Semitism. On several occasions, Khomeini attacks his main political target, Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi as a, quote, Jew, end quote, who took his orders from Israel. The linkage of his fantasies about a, quote, Jewish world state, end quote, that had to be fought, through which he projected his own megalomania onto its prospective Jewish victims with traditional anti-Jewish attitudes, is a classic example of the fusion of Islamic anti-Judaism and modern anti-Semitism that characterizes Islamic anti-Semitism. The continuing presence of Jewish communities in Iran is often used to call into question the anti-Semitic character of the regime. It is indeed true that at present, Jews in Iran are not persecuted to the same extent as other religious minorities, such as Baha'i, Baha'i that are not recognized as, quote, religions of the book, end quote. However, this argument overlooks the fact that Iran's Jews do not enjoy equal civil rights. The Jewish minority faces systematic discrimination and is obliged constantly to distance itself from Israel. Even authors who otherwise downplay Khomeini's explicit anti-Jewish statements as, quote, polemic, end quote, Admit that Jews are considered demis, who are subject to many special rules and disabilities and have to accept Islamic domination. Jews, like most other, quote, recognized, end quote, minorities, cannot be, e.g., ministers, judges, or teachers in regular schools. All the recognized minorities are subject to discriminatory rules, for example, regarding inheritance, giving evidence in court, and in the operation of the, quote, blood money, end quote, system, the financial compensation paid to the family of someone who has been killed or to the victim who has been injured through negligence, which discriminates between Muslims and non-Muslims and between men and women. In the circumstances, it is not surprising that about 90% of the estimated 100 to 150,000 Jews who have lived in the country before the Islamic Revolution of 1979 have since departed. Despite the fact that since the revolution, Khomeini, Khamenei, and other leading figures 
in the regime have publicly stated on several occasions that their policy and ideology is not directed against Jews as long as they distance themselves from Zionism and accept Islamic rule. There have also been explicitly anti-Jewish statements from by no means marginal figures that pay no heed to this rhetorical distinction. It is common to find the terms Jew and Zionist or Jewry and Zionism used interchangeably in Iranian official propaganda. Two, the Iranian regime's Holocaust denial. The heyday of Holocaust denial came during the presidency of Ahmadinejad, who placed it at the center of his policy and rhetoric. But both his predecessors, Ali Akbar Hashemi Rafs Sanjani and Muhammad Katami, were also Holocaust deniers, as is the current supreme guide, Ali Khamenei. Since 2013, the current presidency, excuse me, the current president and his foreign minister, Mohammad Javad Zarif, have toned the Holocaust denial down somewhat, but even under Hassan Rouhani, Iranian official bodies have been involved in Holocaust denial events. The relativization of Nazi crimes has been promoted by the Rouhani administration itself. An example being Zarif's statement that, quote, we condemn the Nazis and, quote, massacre of the Jews. And we also condemn the massacre of Palestinians committed by the Zionists, end quote. Here he not only downgrades the Shoah to a massacre, but also declares the Israelis to be the Nazis of today. Many international observers choose to interpret this statement as a clear break with Holocaust denial. In fact, it represents a modernization of anti-Semitism by adapting it to international anti-Israel custom and practice. Finally, it must be remembered that the official line on such matters is set not by the president or foreign minister, but by the clerical supreme leader, whose powers include the right of appointment to over 100 leading positions in the political, judicial, administrative, military, media, and religious institutions. Quote, Holocaust denial is the official position of Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, and no Iranian official can do anything against it. End quote. Iran's recent history of Holocaust denial competitions, conferences, and films is revealing if we would but look. The first international competition for, quote, Holocaust cartoons, end quote, took place in 2005 shortly after Ahmadinejad's, Ahmadinejad became president. The competition in which, quote, artists, end quote, from 63 countries took part was organized by the Ham Shahari Hamshari, Hamshari Institute, which produces the popular magazine of the same name on behalf of the Tehran city authorities. A selection from the almost 1,200 entries went on public display in August 2006. In December 2006, under the title, quote, Review of the Holocaust, Global Vision, end quote, the most representative Holocaust denial conference to date took place in Iran, organized by the Institute for Political and International Studies, which is attached to the Iranian Foreign Ministry. It was opened by the Iranian Foreign Minister, Men Usher Motaki, and President Ahmadinejad attended the closing ceremony. The event brought together the who's who of the international Holocaust denial scene, among those present were the former head of the KKK, David Duke, Bradley Smith, from the, quote, Committee for Open Debate on the Holocaust, end quote, the German-Australian right-wing extremist, extremist Fre Frederick Tobin, George Thiel, or Thiel, and Robert Farrison from France, or Farrison from France, <laughs> and Herbert Schaller, and 
Wolfgang Fröhlich from Austria. In years following this conference, the Iranian official media played a crucial role in the discussions among and networking within the international Holocaust denial movement. In 2012, the Iranian regime stepped up its anti-Semitic agita agitation when on the 19th of April, the Israeli Day of Commemoration of the Shoah, the state broadcaster showed 10 animated films that denied the Holocaust in a form otherwise found only among declared old and neo-Nazis. All the animations are based on the book Hala cartoons, illustrated by Maziar Bijani and written by Omid Medinejad, which was presented by the Iranian Minister of Education Ali Reza Al Ahmadi in 2008 and was in subsequent years globally disseminated over the internet in several languages. To get an impression of the nauseating character of this explicitly anti Semitic effort, it is sufficient to describe the open scene, which appears in all ten of the films. Excuse me. It is sufficient to describe the opening scene, which appears in all ten of the films. Quote, We see a Nazi, recognizable from the swastika on his armband, holding a large spray can with, quote, gas, end quote, written on it. He activates it. As soon as the screen is totally obscured by the gas... A hook-nosed worm, giggling loudly and marked as Jewish by a kippah, appears and eagerly sucks in the Nazi gas with relish. Finally, he loudly belches out two little clouds of gas that form the word, quote, Holocaust, end quote. The episodes that follow this introduction are on the same level. Quote, one of the films concerns a strange steel contraption displaying the words, quote, gas chamber, end quote. The same ten Jews enter from the front and exit from the back of the chamber, while a meter counts the numbers of through passages and at the number, quote, six million, end quote, rings loudly. Then the ten Jews fall laughing hysterically into one another's arms, having perfectly, stimul perfectly simulated the murder of six million, although not a single one has died, end quote. Matthias Kunzel notes that these films reveal the global significance of the Iranian regime's Holocaust denial. The use of animation in itself indicates that they are aimed at a global audience. Whatever speech and text there is in English is in English, and indeed these pieces were disseminated worldwide, including on YouTube. In 2014, after Rouhani became president, the Iranian regime once again provided a platform in Tehran for the international of conspiracy theorists and anti-Semites with the, quote, Second New Horizon Conference of Independent Thinkers, end quote. This time, alongside the traditional Holocaust deniers, the bulk of the guests were, quote, 9-11 truthers, end quote. The left liberal Israeli daily, Haaretz, has described the New Horizon Conference as networking meetings for, quote, Iranian Revolutionary Guards, Russian Imperialists, Ukrainian Fascists, Chinese Spies, Qaddafi Devotees, Corbyn Fans, Assad Apologists, Neo-Nazis, Trump Devotees, French Holocaust Deniers, Western Anti-War Feminists, African American Separatists, Venezuelan socialists and anti-Semites of every conceivable form and type, end quote. In 2015, the second international Holocaust cartoon competition took place under the auspices of the Iran House of Cartoon and the Sarchesme Cultural Complex with participants from over 50 countries, in May 2016, a selection of cartoons went on show at the 11th International Cartoon Biennial and in the Palestine Contemporary Art Museum in Tehran. In the West, Foreign Minister Zarif claimed that such events were organized by bodies without ties to the state. According to Majid Mohammadi, however, 
There is no doubt about the responsibility of Rouhani's government for these Holocaust cartoon contests and similar events. Quote, the expenses of these activities are totally paid by governmental institutions, whether military, cultural, municipal, or religious. These institutions, their pseudo-branches, and seemingly private affiliates may have misleading titles, but they are all organized, financed, and managed under the Supreme Guide's office, his appointed bodies, and the executive branch headed by the president, end quote. On leader.ir, Kamenai's official English language website, it has continued to be possible under Rouhani's presidency to read about the, quote, myth, end quote, of the Holocaust. Moreover, other prominent figures in the regime have repeatedly spoken in the same vein. Thus, Raf Sanjani declared on Iranian state radio that his personal research had led him to the conclusion that Hitler had murdered no more than 20,000 Jews. The former president, who until his death in 2017 was chairman of the Influential Expediency Council, stated during a visit by the minister-president of Lower Saxony, Stefan Weil, that before the Second World War, the Zionists had destabilized Europe with money and media. Germany had wished to take revenge and, quote, send these people to Palestine, end quote, leading to the establishment of the State of Israel. In contrast to his earlier statements in this case, Raf Sanjani was ready to admit to at least the possibility that six million Jews might have died in the war. However, according to him, this was nothing in comparison with the delusional claim, with his delusional claim, of 20 million deaths and 8 million refugees after the foundation of Israel. His successor, Katami, meanwhile, who to this day is often presented as the model of a, quote, reformist Islamist, end quote, became one of the most passionate defenders of the French Holocaust denier, Roger Garadi, uh, who was a... Uh, originally a member of the French Communist Party. Doesn't say that here, but I just know that because I'm so smart. And arranged for him to have an audience with Kamenai. At the end of 2019, Kamenai on Twitter praised Gorati's, quote, bravery and tirelessness, end quote. In an interview on CNN in 2013, when asked a direct question about the Holocaust, Rouhani answered that he was a politician and not a historian, and could not therefore say anything about the, quote, dimensions of historical events, end quote. In May 2019, Mustafa Pur Mohammadi, interior minister under Ahmadinejad, then justice minister in Rouhani's first cabinet, and now an advisor to the head of the Iranian judiciary, aggressively challenged the reality of the, quote, so-called Holocaust, end quote, declaring that, quote, if we are fighting the Jews, Zionism, then we are fighting the contemporary invasive civilization of arrogance, end quote. Majid Mohammadi succinctly summarizes the different approaches to Holocaust denial of the Iranian regime's various factions, which differ not about the, the basic aims of the Islamic Republic, but how to achieve them, quote, the only difference between the reformists and the non-reformists is their tactics. Reformists believe that denying the Holocaust is not a priority, while the non-reformists believe that hatred against Israel and Jews will increase the Islamic Republic's influence in the region. They believe that exhibitions of Holocaust cartoons help the Islamic Republic to promote its objectives and strategies to be a force in global issues, end quote. Section 3 of this, or, I don't know, section three of this, <laughs> this heading, the Iranian regime's commitment to the destruction of Israel, verbal attacks on Israel, and the support for anti-Israel terrorist groups have been a constant feature of the Iranian regime's ideology and practice, and have been voiced and translated into action since 1979 by all factions of the regime. Hatred of the Jewish state is one of the core elements of the Islamist ideology and is by no means only a, quote, means to an end, end quote. The purpose of the Iranian regime's Holocaust denial and relativization is firstly the retrospective delegitimization 
of the foundation of Israel, and second, the prospective legitimation of its destruction. In Iran, the relativization and denial of Nazi crimes serve the regime's eliminatory anti-Zionism. On the anniversary of the so-called Kristallnacht in 2014, Khamenei published a detailed Q&A headed, quote, Why should and how can Israel be eliminated? End quote. In 2015, Khamenei republished his 400-page book, Palestine, in which he again cited Israel in which again he called Israel, quote, a cancerous tumor, end quote, and demanded its annihilation. In 2016, the regime, in clear violation of the UNSC resolutions, tested ballistic missiles carrying the message, quote, Israel must be wiped out, end quote, in Farsi and Hebrew. In 2015, excuse me, in 2017, according to Iran's press TV, which, uh, Jeremy Corbyn appeared on repeatedly, Rouhani repeated one of Khomeini's catchphrases when he assailed Israel as a, quote, cancerous tumor, end quote, having previously described the Jewish state as a, quote, old wound that has been sitting on the body of the Islamic world, end quote, and a year after his election as a, quote, festering tumor, end quote. In 2017, Khamenei proclaimed Western liberal ideas about equality of the sexes to be a, quote, Zionist plot, end quote, thus demonstrating the intimate connection between anti-Semitism and sexism is not the exclusive property of the European far right. Referring to Israel, he reiterated his view that, quote, there is no cure for the problem of this savage and wolfish regime, has created except its destruction and annihilation, end quote. Faced with statements of such crystal clarity, even in an advocate of closer relations between the European and Iran-like German-Iranian author, Adnan Tabatabai, had to admit, quote, that Holocaust denial remains a permanent feature of the Iranian regime, end quote, and that in relation to Israel and Palestine, the current Iranian regime, quote, clearly opposes a two-state solution, end quote. Time and again, the question arises as to what the role the anti-Semitic ideology and hatred of Israel play in the Iranian regime's political decision-making. The Islamic Republic's foreign policy has, from the outset, been characterized by equal measures of pragmatism and destructive irrationality, and this has enabled Western observers to continually downplay the significance of the latter, the destructive fantasies towards Israel, by reference to the former. In fact, however, as Manashri puts it, quote, Iran's attitude to Israel has been one of the rare, example, rare examples of adherence to dogma, end quote. Representatives of the realist school of international relations refer to the concept of real politic and conclude that it should be possible to pragmatically integrate the Iranian regime into an international or at least regional security architecture. Such conclusions overlook the fact that the Ayatollahs have seized every opportunity to expand their sphere of influence, and they also ignore the fact that, as regards the threat to Israel, pragmatism can have no meaning for Tehran other than waiting for the right moment to go on the offensive. When Khomeini took power in 1979 in Iran, he took a purist view of foreign policy, the thrust of which was documented by one of his first prominent visitors, Yasser Arafat, who in a festive ceremony was given the keys to the former Israeli embassy in Tehran after many future Pasdaran officers had received their initial military training in PLO camps in southern Lebanon. If Khomeini had had his wish, his credo that his Islamic revolution was neither, quote, Western nor Eastern, end quote, e.g. neither capitalist nor socialist, but some kind of an Islamic, quote, third way, end quote, would have been applied to the foreign policy of the newly established Islamic Republic. However, even a fanatic like Khomeini had to yield to the facts of the situation facing the regime in the first decade of its existence. 
In the current situation, many observers are once again pondering the question of how far political pragmatism might affect the revolutionary goal and whether maslahat, expediency over and above ideological principles or goals, a principle that the Iranian Islamists have always recognized, whether entail a renunciation of eliminatory anti-Zionism as part of the basic core of the regime's ideology. Even a mainstream Austrian-Iran expert, such as Walter Posh, accepts that there is no chance of this. When it comes to Israel, Maslahat only means that the Islamic Republic is currently not looking for an all-out war with the Jewish state, but prefers to support its proxies, like Hezbollah in Lebanon and Islamic Jihad in Gaza and the West Bank, with weapons and billions of dollars, and tries to build up a military infrastructure in Syria. Maslahat means, quote, not defeating ideology, but at most restricting its scope, end quote. Moreover, Posh clearly explains that the core of this ideology is a, quote, strategic vision, end quote, based on the, quote, paradigm of the illegitimacy of the state of Israel, end quote. However, this understanding has not prevented Posh from proposing that the West work with the very same figures who have presented the, quote, end of Israel, end quote, as a strategic goal. In particular, Posh advocates the establishment of relations with that very, quote, Iranian think tank scene, end quote, in which such strategic visions of destruction are expressed in the sober language of international relations analysis. So the acceptance by the West of the, quote, moderate constructive foreign policy, end quote, that Posh thinks the Iranian regime could adopt would also mean the acceptance of the, quote, strategic vision, end quote, of the destruction of Israel, end quote, paradigm of the illegitimacy of the Jewish state, end quote, as legitimate positions in international politics. As regards the conspiracy theorizing and projective worldview, Holocaust denial and relativization, and the Iranian regime's threats to destroy Israel, nothing substantial has changed under Rouhani. In early 2018, during his second term, the Iranian regime issued an invitation to the first international Hourglass Festival, whose website, IsraelHourglass.com, attacks the, quote, fake regime, end quote, named Israel. The festival's symbol was a Star of David dissolving through an hourglass. The festival organizer, Hossein Amir Abdullahian, is an aide to the president of the Iranian pseudo-parliament, Ali Larijani, and general secretary of the International Conference in support of the Palestinian Intifada. He served as a deputy, minister, deputy foreign minister under both Ahmadinejad and Rouhani. For several months, submissions were accepted that illustrated the hoped-for end of Israel in the next 25 years and the malicious, quote, quote bestial, end quote, and, quote, inhuman, end quote, character of Zionism and its supporters. The model, uh, model of the festival refers to the speeches by Khamenei from 2015 and 2016, in which he proclaimed that the, quote, Zionist regime, end quote, would be wiped out by 2040 at the latest. In 2017, the ruling Ayatollahs had a large digital clock erected in Tehran that is counting down the days until the final victory over the Jewish state. Three point three Hezbollah, Iran's proxy in Lebanon. All factions of the Iranian regime are also at one when it comes to supporting the anti-Semitic terrorist organizations on Israel's borders. At the beginning of 2019, Foreign Minister Zarif, considered a, quote, moderate, end quote, in Europe, met with Hezbollah, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad movement in Palestine, in Beirut, to discuss future common action, while in Tehran, Rouhani held a high-profile meeting with Zayad, al-Nakhala, 
the new general secretary of Islamic Jihad, Al Nakhala, has significantly stepped up IJ's cooperation with Tehran in comparison with his predecessor, Ramadan Shala, so that it was overta has overtaken Hamas as Iran's main ally in Gaza. Islamic Jihad has overtaken Hamas as Iran's main ally in Gaza. The alliance with the Lebanese terrorist militia, Hezbollah, has been maintained under Rouhani, gaining crucial importance in relation to the war in Syria. Moreover, support of the Houthi rebels in Yemen has also been stepped up in recent years. The Houthi rebels are, has, have long had close ties with Hezbollah and the Pasteran, and has drawn ideologically closer to the Iranian regime since 2015. The slogans of Tehran's Yemeni allies leave no doubt as to their ideological priorities. Quote, God is great, end quote. Quote, death to the USA, end quote. Quote, death to Israel, end quote. Quote, curse on the Jews, end quote. End quote, victory to Islam, end quote. In 2015, Qasem Soleimani, whose influence within the Iranian power structure has grown enormously as a consequence of the Pasteran's involvement in Iraq and Syria, and who was killed in a U.S. airstrike in 2019, declared that Iran might soon control Jordan in the same way as it does now, now does Iraq, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. Soleimani was the commander of the Pasteurans Quds Force, which is responsible for extraterritorial interventions. The name of this force, Al Quds, is the Arabic for Jerusalem, indicate the goal of their efforts. At the end of the 2018 Mohammed, at the end of 2018, Mohammed Reza Nakhdi, deputy commander of the Pasteuran and commander of the Basiji militia announced that Israel, quote, must be destroyed and wiped out, end quote, end quote, Zionists must be annihilated, end quote. Major General Hossein Salami, the commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guards, said in September 2019 that destroying Israel has become a, quote, achievable goal, end quote, thanks to the country's technological advances, quote, this sinister regime must be wiped off the map, end quote. End quote, this is no longer a dream. We have managed to obtain the capacity to destroy the imposter Zionist regime. End quote. Deeds have matched words so that now Israel faces on its borders not only the Iranian regime's allies, but the regime itself. The incursion by an Iranian drone into Israeli airspace in February 2018 represented a dangerous escalation of the situation as did the Iranian rocket attacks on the Golan Heights in May 2018. In particular, Hezbollah's massive military buildup in Lebanon and the Iranian presence in Syria present Israel with huge problems. Hezbollah, Tehran's most important and powerful ally in the region, today possesses over 130,000 rockets aimed exclusively at the Jewish state. How seriously the threat from a Hezbollah armed to the teeth by Tehran is taken in Israel can be seen inter alia from the fact that the liberal daily, Haaretz, has criticized the right-wing Netanyahu government for not intervening to destroy the Lebanese terrorist militia's arsenal. The Lebanese Shiite militia has been involved in many attacks such as the bombing of the Jewish community center in Buenos Aires in 1994, and that killed 85 people. In its general secretary, Hassan Nasrallah, echoes Khamenei and Rouhani in calling Israel a, quote, cancerous, tyrannical, tyrannical entity, end quote, and has described Zionist Jews in classically dehumanizing anti-Semitic terms as the, quote, descendants of apes and pigs, end quote. Back in the early 1990s, the movement's long-standing spiritual leader, Muhammad Hussein Fadlala declared that, quote, the struggle against the Jewish state, end quote, as the, quote, continuation of the struggle of the Muslims 
against the Jews' conspiracy against Islam, end quote. Nasrallah more or less exalts over the fact that Jews come from all over the world to Israel, where the, quote, axis of resistance, end quote, of Iran and Hezbollah can more easily fight them. Quote, the Jews from the entire world will come to occupied Palestine, but this will not be done for their Antichrist to rule. God Almighty wanted to save you the trouble of finding them all over the world. End quote. In 1997, he stated in a speech that, quote, If we search the entire globe for a more cowardly, lowly, weak, and frail individual in this spirit, in his spirit, mind, ideology, and religion, we will never find anyone like the Jew, and I am not saying the Israeli. We have, we have to know the enemy we are fighting, end quote. According to the Hezbollah TV station, Al-Manar, quote, Judaism is a project against all humanity. It's about time the world understands this. Those who are fighting Israel are not just defending themselves, they are defending the whole world. There is no such thing as Zionism. There is only Judaism. End quote. Nasrallah's deputy, Naim Qasim, has declared, quote, The history of Jews has proven that, regardless of the Zionist proposal, they are people who are evil in their ideas, end quote. In the same way as the Iranian regime, Hezbollah denies or relativizes the Holocaust and defends Holocaust deniers, such as Roger Garadi. In 2000, Al-Manar proclaimed that, quote, the Jews have invented the fairy tale of the Nazi massacre against the Jews, end quote. In 2003, Al-Manar broadcast a 26-part series that it explained, which show how, quote, Jews do not shrink from committing the worst crimes in order to realize their Jewish dream, end quote. The whole series in which Jews are accused of responsibility for both the First and Second World Wars must be seen as a modernized dramatization and illustration of the anti-Semitic classic, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, Remco Limchus, Um, Remco Lehmquis, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this name, director of the American Jewish Committee in Berlin, and today one of Germany's leading experts on Hezbollah, has succinctly summed up the central role of anti-Semitism for the Lebanese Shiite militia. It is, quote, not only a basic reference point in Hezbollah's ideology, it is its core, end quote. An analysis of the movement's anti-Semitic propaganda shows that the conflict with Israel, quote, again and again serves as the vehicle for the various anti-Semitic lines of argument, end quote. The battle with the Jewish state is, quote, therefore only a catalyst and provides imagery that constantly serves to revitalize and update anti-Semitic ideologies, end quote. Part 4. End European Appeasement of the Iranian Regime The Iranian regime is today one of the main promoters of global anti-Semitism, and with its ongoing effort to obtain the technology of mass destruction in its pursuit of the related missile program, its regional expansion to the borders of Israel, and the massive armoring of its equally anti-Semitic allies such as Hezbollah, it currently presents the main danger to the security of the Jewish state. This is reflected in the official military strategy of the Israeli Defense Forces. It is hard to overestimate the contribution that the fall of the regime of the Ayatollahs and Pasteurant would make to the fight against global anti-Semitism and, def- and for the defense of Israel. In these circumstances, it is necessary to break taboo, a taboo <coughs> in the European discussion of Iran, and envisage as a both realistic and desirable prospect that scenario that the German Social Democratic Foreign Minister, Heiko Maas, can imagine only as a nightmare, a future for Iran beyond the rule of the Ayatollahs and the Revolutionary Guards. It brings, to help bring this about, the European Union must abandon its cooperation and appeasement policy towards Tehran. The nuclear agreement of 2015, to which the European Union still clings, 
did not lead to the end of the Iranian nuclear and missile programs, but to their institutionalization. The Ayatollah's missile program, which is an essential component of its bid for a nuclear weapons capability, was excluded from the agreement. The entire infrastructure of the nuclear program remains intact. While the nuclear facilities have been modified and subjected to conditions, the structures themselves are still there. The permanent and unrestricted monitoring that supporters of the agreement for a long time considered essential has not happened, especially with respect to the military structures that the IAEA suspect of having been used for testing nuclear warheads. It is therefore not surprising that the regime has been found to have broadly adhered to the agreement. With the expiry of the, in any case, absolutely inadequate restrictions in a few years' time, the JCPOA will have paved the way to the bomb instead of blocking the bomb. The deal was a gamble on the future. The agreement supporters hoped to persuade the Iranian regime to moderate its behavior. Developments over the past few years, however, have been seen in the opposite direction. The regime has been encouraged by the deal to pursue an extremely aggressive foreign policy financed by the billions that have flowed in as a result of the ideal itself. The 700 rockets which were fired at Israel from Gaza in May 2019 once again showed that cooperation with the Iranian regime has not brought about the stability the European Union has hoped for, but fostered war and terror. When Iranian-backed terrorist groups attack Israel, more than merely verbal solidarity is required from Europe. If the commitment to Israel's security is to be more than, an em than empty words, then the European countries, and above all Germany, as the successor state to National Socialism, must immediately impose stringent sanctions on the Holocaust denier regime in Tehran that facilitates the attacks of both Hamas and Islamic Jihad on the state of the Shoah's survivors. However, to this end, the European Union must also free itself from the blackmail to which it exposes itself as a result of the negotiations over the Iranian nuclear program. The idea of moderating the regime through integrating it into international trade has proved totally illusory. A 180-degree turn in German and European policy towards Iran is urgently needed. There must be no more support for the anti-Semitic regime and full support for the democratic and secular opposition in Iran and in exile. Part 5. Towards a universal, non-selective anti-fascism. For Iran's government, every success in forging business links means progress in its jihad against emancipation and enlightenment. Its pursuit of nuclear bomb technology has to be understood in relation to its political program of annihilation. If liberal and radical leftists want to be serious about Adorno's categorical imperative, then they should do everything to prevent the Iranian regime from realizing its murderous ideology and facilitate the Iranian regime's overthrow. In, this, in his collection of aphorisms, Minima Moralia, Adorno quoted, quoted F. H. Bradley, quote, Where everything is bad, it must be good to know the worst. End quote. The confrontation between Iran and the liberal West, and Israel in particular, represents an existential and therefore non-negotiable conflict. Iran considers the destruction of Israel merely a prelude for turning the rest of the world into a jihadistically, quote, liberated, end quote, hell. For that reason, and not for bellicosity, a materialist critique in the tradition of Marx and critical theory must defy any kind of appeasement towards these pro those protagonists of a barbarism that originates in enlightenment and the process of civilization, but is by no means identical with it. The fight against the Iranian regime and its allies deserves the support of anybody who is not indifferent to the ideas of enlightenment and universal emancipation as, envisioned, as envisioned by Marx and Adorno. We need an anti-fascism that opposes every form of counter-enlightenment. The currently dominant left and liberal anti-fascism, which focuses on the European far-right parties, have to confront the question of why several thousand people rightly demonstrate regularly in Vienna against the FPO's 
academic ball, viewed as one of the European far right's most important networking events, but only a handful of turnout when representatives of the Iranian Holocaust denier regime are welcomed by the highest officials of state with full pomp and ceremony. And why can tens of thousands be mobilized for marches against the AFD, but barely a hundred when supporters of the openly anti-Semitic Hamas movement hold large-scale events in Berlin? We need a cosmopolitan critique of political Islam that, develop, that adopts the slogan of the tens of thousands of women who demonstrated day after day in 1979 against the imposition of the headscarf in Iran. Quote, emancipation is not Western or Eastern, but universal, end quote.